our denomination, our, our, of our collection of denominations, and so she's going to be telling you more about that. Um, we have announcements today. We have a birthday and an anniversary, and I think we're going to miss both of them today. I think they're, they're both traveling. So if you're watching online, <laughs> Larissa, uh, Rich, Janelle, happy, happy birthday or anniversary, as the case may be. Should we sing? That may be a bit too much. Maybe. Oh, we're going to have your back. Excellent. Hi. Um, so yeah, we'll skip the singing. Um, Moving along, so that, you, you know churches need the money, so um, uh, next, okay, there, thank you, next. All right, so men's Bible study continues 10 a.m. downstairs, that's the um, uh, first, second, and third letters of John, so um, that's not as much reading as you might think, the first letter is the only one that's long, the second and third are just one chapter apiece. That's 10 a.m. on Tuesdays. On Wednesdays, there is the Screwtape Letters book study, study, which is over at Trinity. And we're reading uh, C.S. Lewis's Screwtape Letters. They are a correspondence, an imaginary correspondence between two demons telling you how to, how to, how to provoke people to sin. All right. Um, so garden watering. We have a beautiful uh, um, uh, garden out there. And uh, there are people who are watering it, but you can still get in on the fun. If you want to water, uh, talk, to, talk to Sharon. I saw Sharon earlier. Sharon's going to be the, uh, the backup for Jill. <laughs> in terms, I see her the most out there watering, so she's going to be our, our de facto Jill. All right. And there's other work going on. There's always work to, going on at churches. So you might have noticed that we have a new copper-colored uh, perimeter of the education building. That did not just get put up there by elves. That was done by the Reynolds brothers, and um, the lawn is mowed, and so forth. So there's all kinds of opportunities to serve in the church. And if you're thinking, boy, I don't want to do any of those, there's always gardening water. So watering, gar watering the garden. Moving on. All right. So next week is one of my favorite things. I didn't get to do it because of Easter, but um, every fifth Sunday we do something here called Ask Me Anything, and uh, what you can do is uh, ask me anything. So uh, it can be a question about a particular Bible passage. It can be some theological topic. Um, if, if what Elizabeth tells you today about the Presbyterians makes you go, what was that? You know, you can, <laughs> you can ask me about that. So, any question um, you, you want, um, uh, just uh, bring it next week and we'll go through those as quickly as we can. All right, so that's next Sunday. And as always, we can always use people to uh, deepen our bench in back. So uh, worship and arts technicians, it's not as hard as it looks. They're able to even make me look good. So, all right. Even a third grader can do it. Even a third grader can do it. That's true. Fourth grader. Rising? Rising fourth grader? Yeah. Okay. All right. So that leads us finally to our oh uh, connection cards. Um, if you have prayer concerns, there are also prayer cards. But if uh, we need your, if you would like us to have um, your your um, connection information, um, anything that you'd like us to know, uh, you can give us those on these connection cards. For those of you who are worshiping with us online, uh, you can use the chat for the same feature. Uh, people can know what's going on in your life that you'd like to share with them. Uh, you know, if you have a particular joy or concern you'd like to include in our prayers, do let other people know you're worshiping. It makes it, it makes it more fun for the for everybody if if they know other people are online with them. So, all right. And now our call to worship today um, is from Jesus. Jesus told us that those who find their lives will lose them, and those who lose their lives because of me will find them. Let us pray. O God, our Defender. Storms rage about us and cause us to be afraid. Rescue your people from despair. Deliver your sons and daughters from fear and preserve us all from unbelief. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and rules all things with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right, before we sing, I just realized we've got some representatives in the back. I, we, we did the thing at the, um, the thing. We did, we did serving the meal at the Hope Center this past week. And I see some veterans of that. And I took my phone, and I didn't get any pictures at all. So bad me. Otherwise, they would have been up there. Let me ask you this. Did you enjoy it, or was it terrible? I enjoyed it. Okay. 
So the next time we set one of those up, you have, you have uh, um, uh, testimonials from people who said it was really fun. So you just have to imagine it because there's no pictures. All right, now with that, um, please uh, stand as you're able and join in singing our opening songs. <laughs> The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinning, Christ died for us. 
Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace in time of need. Trusting in God's faithfulness and compassion, let us confess our sin before God, first in silence. Let us pray. O holy and merciful God, we confess we have not always taken upon ourselves your yoke of obedience, nor have we been willing to seek and do your perfect will. We have not loved you with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength, nor have we loved our neighbors as ourselves. You have called to us in the needs of our sisters and brothers, and we have passed unheeding on our way. In the pride of our hearts and our unwillingness to repent, we have turned away from the cross of Christ and grieved your Holy Spirit. Forgive us, revive us, and reform us in your image. In Jesus' name, amen. Hear the good news proclaimed in Scripture. God forgives us because it is in his character to do so. The Lord is trustworthy in all that he says, faithful in all that he does. The Lord supports all who fall down, straightens up all who are bent low. People of God, look to the cross and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks Thanks be to God. Since we have peace with God, let us be people of peace. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Please give a sign of peace to the people around you.
invite any young uh, people up to the front so I can talk with you. She's getting heavy. She's getting big. She's getting old, just like you did. Just any old seat. You're fine. All right. Or you can sit in the row behind with your cousin. Yeah. All right. So I want to ask you a question. Do you know what an ambassador is? What is an ambassador? It's a big word, I know. So it's something that we don't bump into a lot because there aren't any embassies or anything like that in Alaska that I'm aware of. We might have, do we have any consulates or anything like that? Yeah. So an embassy is when one country wants to have some kind of connection to another country, right? So maybe they've got issues, they want to do trade, like, you know, we want to buy things that they make or we want to sell them things we make, right? So for whatever reason, or maybe because um, there used to be, there was a war in the past and the countries have settled that war, but they want to get along better now. So what they'll have is they'll have an embassy in, you know, country A will have an embassy in country B and country B will have an embassy in country A. And what, what the, the people who work in an embassy are called diplomats or sometimes some of them are called ambassadors. And in our reading today, Paul says that we're ambassadors. So here's a question. So if we're an ambassador, right, but we're, we're Americans, right? You're all Americans? Are you all Americans? All right, tough question. I know that I didn't prep you for this. What country do you think you're citizens of? All right, how many of you were born in the United States? Okay, I have good news for you. You're all citizens of the, of the United States. Okay, so, so. That means if you went to Russia or to China or to Germany or France, you could be an ambassador there, right? So here's a question. When Paul says in his letter that we're ambassadors, what kind of ambassadors do you think he is? He's talking about. Because the United States didn't even exist when Paul wrote, right? So what do you think he was thinking of? He says, he says we are ambassadors for Christ. So as Christians, what we do is we show people who may not know about Jesus, we show them the love of Christ. So I know some of you were able to come to the Hope Center with us last, last week, and that's a way that we are ambassadors from Christ. We show the world that Christ cares about those people, right? And so we care about them too, but what we're showing them by showing up at the, at the Hope Center is we're showing them that God loves them that God cares about people. So everything we do is a way of showing people who may not know anything about Jesus, showing them something about Jesus. So if you're a big jerk, and I know sometimes brothers and sisters, they feel that way about each other, but if you go through life and everybody is kind of thinking, I don't like her, or I don't like him, then you're probably not being a great ambassador, right? So let me just encourage you with that thought. You're not just ambassador for the United States. You're not just ambassador for your family. You're not just an ambassador for Alaska. You are an ambassador for Christ. And so remember that because Jesus wants people to see you and remember that he loves them, okay? So we can be ambassadors from Christ that way. Let's pray. Father in heaven, sometimes we are not great ambassadors, but um, help us to be better ones. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thanks for coming up. All right. And... All right. So... All right, the, by the way, we are just FYI, we're trying to hire some um, uh, childcare workers uh, because Sam's pretty much it. And so uh, we're looking for them. If you know anybody who might make a good childcare worker on Sunday mornings, let us know and let them know that we're looking, please do. All right, and with that, um, uh, where are we? So. God um, calls us to be generous people. 
in the book of Chronicles, uh, Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, asks this question. He says, who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly? Since everything we, we have comes from you, we have given you that which comes from your own hand. He says, God has equipped us to be generous people in the world. So I invite you to be generous people uh, in this church and everywhere else you go as a part of that idea of being an ambassador. Be generous people because God is generous and God wants you to be generous in his name. So um, uh, if you want to be generous to this church to support the work God is doing in and through this church, we have a slide coming up that you can take a picture of with your phone and it's got a URL coded up as a QR code and it's coming shortly. Or maybe it's not. Okay, so talk to the guy who made the slide deck this morning and took it out. Oops. All right. So, where were we? All right, so that's one way. We have the box and back old school and uh, jlp.church slash give. All right. Let us pray. Lord God, we bless you for all of your many gifts to us and we return our gifts today as a token of our gratitude. We pray that you would give us the conviction and strength to offer our whole lives to your service. Through Christ our Lord, amen. As we continue in our time of prayer, again, I'd invite those of you who are worshiping with us online, please do use the chat. Let other people know what you're thankful for or what you have particular concerns about so that they can join you in their prayers. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the beauty of the earth that is so evident during summer in Alaska. We thank you for all of the many gracious mercies you pour out on us, all the ways that our lives are better than they might be. And we ask that you would pour out on us the power and wisdom of your spirit, that we may walk the way of the cross that Christ taught us, ready to offer even our lives to show the world our hope in your kingdom. We pray, O oh God, for your church here and elsewhere. We ask you to bless our leaders with a clear sense of mission and confidence wherever you lead. Lord, we pray for other churches in our denomination, for the Sabunga Presbyterian Church, that you would raise up um, uh, new leaders and uh, revitalize the, the existing congregation, that they would be a witness to you in that place. We pray, O oh God, as well for the Alaska United Methodist Conference meeting this week and taking up the challenges that um, are facing that denomination and the Western jurisdiction and the Alaska Conference. Lord, we pray for prominent churches in our land that you would protect them and especially leaders from error and um, scandal. Today we pray for Central Christian Church in Henderson, Nevada and their pastor, Jed Wilhite. And from here in our mission field, we pray for Sand Lake Baptist and their pastor, John Priestley. Oh God, we lift up to you the church in which, uh, the world in which the church serves. We pray for Ukraine and Gaza as the wars grind on in those places with so much suffering. And we pray for Sudan where Nine million people have been displaced, 150,000 people dead, with threats of famine and disease spreading to surrounding countries, Lord. Help us to remember that there are people suffering that we read about in the news and people suffering without our knowledge. Lord, we pray for our nation that you would guide our citizens and our leaders to address its problems. We think today of mass shootings this, hap this past week in urban Ohio and in rural Arkansas. We pray for people recovering from tornado damage in Wisconsin and flooding in Iowa. We pray for those who have been harmed by the New Mexico wildfires. We pray that the arsonists would be found and we ask your blessing on the the families of those who have been killed and the hundreds who have lost their homes. We pray, O oh God, for our own community, for our new mayor and the range of promises that she and the 
um, assembly face ranging from public bathrooms to killings in the area behind Home Depot on Tudor. We pray for the situations that escalate into officer-involved shootings. We ask you for creativity and courage to do what is needed to make this community safe and just. And finally, O oh God, we are bold to pray for ourselves and for the needs of those who are known to us, for the sick and the sorrowful, the infirm, the unwell, the aged. We pray for Pete in the hospital, and we pray for uh, Jenny's parents, but particularly for her father, and we give thanks for a successful vascular surgery and the pneumonia that uh, complicated his stay um, have been treated successfully. And now, Lord, we um, ask you to speed them home after three weeks in Minnesota. As we name all of these concerns before you, O oh God, we ask you to remember those we name in the private thoughts of our hearts. Finally, O oh God, we pray that you would hasten the day when whatever pleases you is true here as well as there, the day when heaven comes down to earth, the day promised by our Lord Jesus, your Son, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray now that God would open our hearts to hear his truth. Let us pray. Send out your light and your truth, O God, and let them guide us. Let them lead us to your holy mountain, to the place where you live. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Our first reading of scripture this morning comes to us from the first letter of John, chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Listen for God's word to you. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Our second scripture from this morning is from the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we no longer know him that way. So if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Look, new things have come into being. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, God made the one who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So good morning. Thank you for having me at your church. Um, a few of you I have met at Presbytery meetings or in various things because Anchorage is a small community and we all see each other. Um, but you might not have met me, so I wanted to just start with a little bit of an introduction of who I am. Um, if you have not met me, um, as Pastor Luke said, I'm the new executive presbyter of the Presbytery of Yukon. Can I just have a quick show of hands? Who here is very familiar with the Presbytery? 
I'm thinking most people in this church. Okay, so I saw several. You've got some very active members in your church in the Presbytery, but not everybody knows these things, and I never want to assume, especially if you're not from a Presbyterian church, what is the Presbytery, what is that word? So the short version of that is the Presbytery is all members and clergy of the Presbyterian churches in Alaska from southeast Alaska on up. So the Presbytery of Yukon includes Anchorage all the way up to Barrow, which is now Uktiavik, and all the rest of the state. Southeast Alaska is in a separate presbytery, Northwest Coast Presbytery. So our presbytery has 20 churches, um, Fairbanks, New Hope, churches in Eagle River, Palmer, Gamble. We have 20 of them. We have um, seven mission churches that are located in Alaska Native congregations. And we have just a few staff members. I am the only full-time staff member of the Presbytery. We have a part-time stated clerk, and we have a part-time administrator of finance and operations. So there's three of us holding things together. Um, and you might be very familiar with the stated clerk position because Sharon Rate was in that position for a very long time, your dear member here. But my role as the EP is to be in relationship with my staff all of you as members of the Presbytery, all of the pastors of the Presbytery, and the sessions, and the congregations. So I am kind of known as a pastor to all of you and a support to all of you. So I wanted to make sure you knew who I was, and I wanted to thank you for the work that you, um, the support that you have shown in this congregation, particularly to the Presbytery. Pastor Luke is the moderator of Presbytery right now. He serves on many um, important committees. Joanne, Sharon, maybe others of you. I'm missing Dennis. We've got the Reynolds brothers have done a lot of work in Presbyterian churches. You all have been incredibly supportive. So thank you for your um, work and your relationship to the Presbytery over the years because we sort of all need to do this together. That's the way that it works. A connectional church, we all need to be working together. And like I said, there's so few of us on staff. If it weren't for all of the committees coming together, together as a whole and serving all of these churches. Um, we have the largest geographical spread, I think, of any presbytery in the country. We are so unique and so special up here in Alaska. So thank you for your time with our presbytery. Um, a brief little bit of who I am and why I live in Alaska. Alaska has been my home now for almost 15 years, but those have been broken up into two stints. I first came to Alaska in 1994 and spent a summer in Southeast Alaska through a program called Southeast Alaska Volunteers in Mission, which was a ministry to all of the different villages and communities and towns. We went on float plane and boat and it was fantastic. And I was very young and kind of fell in love with Alaska through that experience and went back to my campus ministry job. I met my husband, Matt, the next year. I told him if he wanted to date me, he's going to have to be ready to move to Alaska someday. And then that actually ended up happening. Um, we met the pastor of First Presbyterian Church back in 1997, right after we were married. He was back east. And um, he recruited us to come up and be youth pastors where we were at First Presbyterian Church from 97 to 2001. Then this presbytery of Yukon sent us to seminary and supported us through seminary. So we each went to seminary and we took a few calls on the East Coast and moved back to Alaska in 2013. So my husband is Reverend Matt Schultz at First Presbyterian Church in downtown Anchorage. And then I was working in a couple different nonprofit roles until I felt God call me to this role last year. So I'm new to the Presbytery position, but I'm not new to the Presbytery and I'm not new to Alaska. But I'm so thankful to be here. Um, so that's a bit about the Presbytery, the role of executive presbyter, why the heck I'm here and why I'm here this morning with you. And now I have a job for you. Would you mind taking out your wallets? Not to give money to me or to the Presbytery, but take out your wallets and I want you to look through them and tell me a few things that you found in there that might identify yourself. If anybody, or if you have a bag or a purse, do you have anything in your wallet that would tell you who you are? And for example, my wallet is in one of these phone cases. So I've got a yogurt lounge, Oh, a sweet caribou card. I have a yogurt lounge coupon. Raise your hand. Do you know yogurt lounge? I'm sure you kids. Okay, yogurt lounge for sure. Um, I've got a credit card. I've got my insurance card. I've got my license. I've got my AARP card because I'm over 50, so I definitely use that for coupons. What else do I have? I have a gift card to Brew House. I forgot we even had that, so we should use that soon. Um, those are a few of the things I have. What do some of you have? 
Does anybody want to volunteer? Do they have any identifiers in your wallet? Voter ID. Your voter ID, okay. Your driver's license, excellent. VA medical card. Your medical card, okay. Your VA medical card, is that what you said? Okay. Medicare card. Your Medicare card. Yep. Military ID. Your military ID, okay. Okay. Membership of Presbytery. <laughs> excellent, <laughs> that's good. So if I found those wallets on the ground and I needed to return them to you and I was being nosy and I looked through the wallet and tried to, you know, after your identifying license, maybe thought, who else is this person? Um, I would know some things about you, right? I might know that you were in the military. I might know what restaurants you go to. I might know if you're covered by insurance. Those are some things I might know if I found your wallet. I might know where your favorite frozen yogurt place is. But would I know you? Would I deeply, deeply know who you are, what matters to you, what's important to you? I might know some of that, especially if you have a photo in your wallet. You might have a wedding photo or photos of your children or grandchildren, so then I would know who your beloved people are, but I really wouldn't know who they are. So would I know you deeply if I found your wallet? Probably not. But I wanted to talk this morning about how we identify ourselves and how we remind ourselves of what our true identity is. I took the idea for this sermon from a sermon that was offered um, at a retreat that I went to recently with other people that were new in the role that I'm in. So other new executive presbyters around the country or new stated clerks. And we were together for a training and one of the preachers shared um, a message with us saying, you might be wondering if you are called to this job. You might have felt very called to this job when you took it, but now you've been in it for a few months and you might be panicking and thinking, what have I gotten into? I'm not qualified for this. This challenge is too difficult for me. Am I really, did I misunderstand? Am I called for this? Do I have the capabilities? And I think that's probably true for any job or any new challenge in life. We take on and think, maybe I'm not meant to be here. Maybe I don't have what it takes. Maybe for you kids, you're in a class at school and you think, oh my gosh, this is way too hard. Was I supposed to do this? So that's called imposter syndrome, right? Where we think, I'm not supposed to be here. And that check and challenge to ourselves, what is my identity? Am I a pastor? Am I an engineer? Am I an eighth grade student who can pass this class? Where are my identity and where do I hold my identifiers? And we can get very overwhelmed very fast. And this pastor said, I want to encourage you. You are not your job. You are not just the executive presbyter or the new stated clerk. This is what you are. You are called. You are gifted. You are baptized. And you are beloved. Trust in these truths and trust in your faith and trust in God. You were called to this role. You are gifted for it. You have been baptized, but most importantly, you are beloved. And then she handed out identity cards, which I still have in my wallet, that says, beloved, baptized, gifted, called. And she said, carry these around with you for those moments where you are going to forget and you are going to wonder about who you are, what you're doing in your role, what you're doing on this planet, life's issues are going to overwhelm you. If you happen to open your wallet, get gas in your car, you're going to see this, and you're going to go, that's right, I am beloved. I am called. I've been baptized. My identity, my main identity is I am a child of God, and that is a gift, and we need to be reminded. These assurances and promises for all of us are found in our scriptures this morning and found throughout the scriptures. In 1 John, see what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not been revealed. And from 2 Corinthians, from now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we no longer know him that way. So if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation, Everything old has passed away. Look, new things have come into being. We all have human ways of identifying ourselves. That is the way we've lived our lives for our whole lives. But our true identity as Christians, as people of faith, is that we are a new creation. 
when we are in Christ. We are beloved children of God, loved, gifted, unique, and celebrated by God every day. Those words all encompass, are encompassed by the word beloved. You are beloved by God. You are beloved children of God. We are in constant danger of returning to our human ways of understanding. We regularly define ourselves by other things. If you'd be willing to shout it out, what are some ways that you identify yourself? What are some other things if somebody said, tell me about you, what would you say? Grandma. Yeah, I'm a grandma. A teacher. A teacher. A what? Alaskan. Alaskan? What was that? A dad. dad. Yep. These are all true, right? These are all very true. They're good. But they're human, and sometimes they can be limited. And the danger of some of the ways we identify ourselves is that they can change. And if we've held on to those identifiers as our main identifier and something changes, Well, then what happens? When a job is lost and you've identified yourself mainly by your job, you can be left floundering. Who am I now? If you really loved your job and you were looking forward to retirement and then you retired and that was gone, there's that sense of, what am I doing? Who am I now? When a family changes through divorce or death, you lose a little bit of what identified you. And if you are only identifying yourself, Through those human point of views, we can be in trouble. Kids out there, (laughs) I want you to listen. I worry about this with my children. I have teenagers. The world is absolutely screaming at you about how you should identify yourself, right? And if you have one of these, you're looking at videos and TikToks and Snapchats and Instagrams and all the things, and you're learning what is it that you're supposed to be. And they're very worldly messages that can get you very confused. You can start to compare yourself to others. We all do that, no matter what age. And you think, do I look right? Do I have the right grades? Am I doing as well on the sports team as others? What about my instruments? Am I as good at, you know, other people might be better. And you're going to fall into that trap of, who am I? Am I good enough? I remember those days, if we admit it, we all remember those days where we compare and question our identity. We ask ourselves, am I measuring up? But brothers and sisters, we are children of Christ. Of course we measure up. Hear again the good news from our scriptures. From now on, we regard no one from a human point of view. Your truest identity, the one that is absolutely unchangeable, that is not dependent on any human status, on any success or failure or job salary or what anybody else thinks of you. Your absolute identity is you are God's creation and you are beloved. The whole through line of the Bible tells us this, that God has love for his children and hope that they will come to an understanding of how precious they are. Think of the parables of Jesus, the lost coin, the lost sheep, the prodigal son. In each of these, Jesus takes the human point of view and flips it. And he says, yes, finding one coin or one sheep is that important. This is how precious individuals are to me. Yes, celebrating the son who is the villain of the story is the one who makes mistake after mistake and wastes so much, but that is the right thing to do because that is what it means to be beloved. They are God's creation. They are beloved. You are God's creation. You are beloved. So I have a gift for you, and I wonder, kids, would you be willing to help me with something? Come up here and help me. You can say no if you don't want to, but I have some things to hand out, if you'd be willing. I have an identity card for all of you. I think I have enough. If you take those and hand them out to some people, if you take those and hand them out over here, hopefully I have enough. I have more here. This is your identity card that I want you to put in your wallet. It says, you are God's creation. You are beloved. I want you to hold this in your heart because the world is going to give you human points of view. From the minute you walk out of here today, you're going to be hit with the world's values. Take this card, and kids, especially you, I want you to hold on to it. Maybe you put it at home on your dresser or your mirror. I want you to hold this truth in your heart because 
you have the danger of being insecure and being feeling like you're having to measure up. And I want you to be reminded every single day of your lives, you are God's creation. You are beloved. That is your true identity. No one can take that away. It's the biggest gift of being a Christian. You are so loved by God, no matter what happens to you outside of these walls. Okay? Amen. Please stand as you're able and join in singing our hymn. The world will meet you, and you will have struggles, you have pain, you have things going on in your lives, I know, in your jobs, in your homes, in your families. Please take a deep breath right now, and just tell yourself, remind yourself of this gift. I am God's creation. I am beloved by God. Friends, go into the world knowing that no one can take that away. You are God's creation. You are beloved. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.